Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Hitzer, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, as as Eckhart says, this is the first time for me to come to your campus, your beautiful green campus, I have to say, coming from Tokyo. Um, uh, before I maybe start, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am from Iceland. Um, I came here to Japan in 2007 to, to study at Waseda University, studied international relations and sustainable development. Um, graduated in, in 2010 and uh, worked for Iceland Air, which is a travel company. Uh, not really a sustainable industry, but very fun nonetheless. Um, and then I joined the, the, the Icelandic embassy in 2010, uh, 13, sorry. Um, and what, it's a very small embassy in, 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 in Tokyo, uh, but one of the, the things that I've been very lucky to be able to attend to is promotion of, of sustainability, uh, sort of the Icelandic experience, uh, what we've been doing for the last couple of, of years. Is there something that we can teach Japan? Is there something that we can learn from Japan, etc.? cetera? So uh, it, it has given me great freedom to sort of do what I want to do and coming to speak to you here today is, is a great opportunity for me as well. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is, is geothermal energy in, in general uh, and distributed heating maybe uh, specifically. Uh, as you know, or, or I will go into this a little bit later, um, the situation in the geothermal sort of uh, geology of Iceland and Japan are, are in many ways very similar. So I hope you can sort of after, after the presentation today, maybe think about what the Icelandic uh, experience has been, if there's something, some similarities to the Japanese one. Um, but first, I want to make sure that everybody knows where Iceland is. Um, you're very smart kids, I'm sure, and, uh, but people very often ask me, are you from Ireland, are you from Iceland, and there's confusion. But we are, it's Iceland, as ice cream up in the North Atlantic, right between uh, North America and Europe. Um, we are very strategically located. Uh, as you know, global warming, etc., cetera, is, is changing the situation in the Arctic especially, uh, meaning that, uh, for example, transport from Asia to Europe might change in the next, uh, let's say, 50 years. And uh, in that sense, Iceland is, is very well placed to be part of, of uh, new logistic dynamic. Uh, we are also very uh, sort of strategically located when it comes to transport transatlantically. Uh, the shortest uh, route from Japan to uh, Europe would be through Iceland, ideally. Um, but this means that you would have to fly over the Arctic which at the moment is not possible because of regulation you have to have uh, emergency airports and as you probably know there are no emergency airports in the Arctic. But this is a dream for Iceland that someday when you go to Europe instead of flying directly from let's say Tokyo to Paris you would fly Tokyo, Iceland, Paris and save two hours. Uh, and this is just self-promotion, I used to work for Iceland Air uh, if you're ever in America or in, in, in Europe traveling transatlantically, we have the most destinations of any airline uh, in Europe flying transatlantic flights. Um, this is, we have more destinations than the Scandinavian carriers. Um, so if, you're, if you have the chance flying transatlantically, you can spend half a day, one day in Iceland and, and, and lose no money. Now, um, the climate, we are, we are called Iceland. It's very misleading. Um, there is a very old, and nobody knows if this is true, true or not, there's an old story that the Vikings, when they came to Iceland about a thousand years ago, um, they found that Iceland was beautiful and they wanted to keep it for themselves. And they decided, as a very smart marketing ploy, to keep people away, to call it Iceland. because. Nobody wants to go to a country that's called Iceland. There's nothing there. There's no greenery, no possibilities to uh, develop. Uh, then on the other hand, uh, the Vikings that went to Greenland, 
they decided, okay, this is, a, this is an icy place, we need more people to come here. So they decided to call that place Greenland, uh, trying to attract more people. So in reality, the names should be reverse. Iceland should be Greenland, and Greenland should be Iceland. Uh, we are a relatively large island in, in terms of, of space. We are 100,000, a little bit more than 100,000 square kilometers, which is uh, the third of the size of all the Japanese landmass. Uh, and despite the name, the climate in Iceland is very temperate. Um, I'm not going to say it's, it's, it's warm and nice. We fluctuate between minus 5 to 10 to 15 degrees almost a year round. Um, so when you're looking for a cool destination to go in the, in the high summer, Iceland is also a very good place to go. And on this island of uh, 100,000 square meters, 100,000 square kilometers, uh, there are about 323,000 uh, people, uh, which is very, very small for a population. Uh, and we have probably some of the most space per capita for each person living in the country in the world. Uh, but being in the North Atlantic means that we have very, very good uh, reach to seafood, other sort of sea-related resources. Um, and that are one, of, one of the things that people have, have said about Iceland is because we eat a lot of fish, we have some of the longest life expectancy in the world. We share, actually, the top place with Japan. Uh, the females in Japan are the, have the longest life expectancy. I think the, the most recent statistic was 87 years. Uh, and the longest life expectancy for, for males in the world uh, was 81.2 in 2013. Uh, and those are Icelandic males. The GDP per capita Sort of the, the overall si economic situation of people living in Iceland is, is relatively good. It's a little less good as it was before we had a massive uh, banking crisis in 2008, uh, but relatively people are well off. The GDP per capita is very good. The, the purchasing power of Icelandic citizens is very good. So we are up, excuse me, almost on par with the other Scandinavian countries. Um, and Scandinavia in Japanese is Hokko, so that would be Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. We have an exclusive economic zone, which means that all of the fish that comes into our uh, economic area is around 200 nautical miles around Iceland, which is quite large. We have no other country competing for the special economic zone. Um, the North Atlantic is, is not a competitive place in terms of land mass, so we've been very lucky in that sense. Now, uh, habitation in Iceland is focused around the coastline. Uh, this is historically due to fishing industry uh, developing in the coastal regions, but it's also due to the fact that in the highlands, in the middle of the country, it's a very barren landscape. There is very little vegetation. There is very little good soil to start any, uh, any type of uh, real agricultural development. And we have massive glaciers feeding uh, large glacial rivers running to the coastlines. Just to give you a sense of what the Icelandic landscape looks like, this is a very uh, this is a picture taken from the, the west of Iceland on the tip, which holds the, the oldest sediments of the Icelandic uh, geology. So what started out uh, many hundreds of thousands of years ago has sort of spread out towards the coastlines of Iceland, giving you a sort of a glacially cut uh, volcanic landscape. Now, our May, biggest uh, economic uh, driver in Iceland has been seafood, and this has been true for the last thousand years. It was only last year that tourism supplanted uh, fisheries as our biggest economic driver. Uh, we are, again, being uh, located in the North Atlantic, very connected, 
but we also offer Iceland, uh, tourism from, tourists from around the world a very unspoilt tourism destination. Uh, this is just purely for, for my pleasure, uh, because last year we uh, sold the first Icelandic tuna on Tsukiji market in, in Tokyo. Um, this is, um, how should I say, is something that's uh, following global warming, meaning that tuna stocks are slowly going further north and only two years ago they started coming into the Icelandic exclusive economic zone. But this is a very contentious point because now we're fighting with other North Atlantic nations about who actually owns the tuna. But onwards to sort of the main topic of today. Uh, the geothermal resource uh, is massive. We all know that there's a lot of potential, not only in the current geothermal development, but also in future development of the geothermal resource. Uh, these, the, uh, these are actually uh, calculated in exojoules, uh, a little bit complicated. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand 100% what an exojoule is, but uh, I think a little bit less than a gigajoule, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, much more than a, sorry, much more than a gigajoule. But we use about 400 exajoules annually, and this is all, all, all of uh, mankind. I think the uh, America only uses about 94 exajoules a year. Uh, and only 0.1% of all this stored heat would be enough to satisfy our global energy consumption for 10,000 years. So we are only s scraping the surface, literally, of, of what we can do with geothermal in the future. Uh, again, Iceland is lucky, in a sense, about its uh, location. We are located exactly on the rift between the Eurasian plate and the North American plate. Um, it's actually an interesting fact that the Eurasian plate, the, the ground that comes up in Iceland, comes down in Tokyo, basically, where you have three uh, tectonic plates meeting in Tokyo. One of those plates is actually coming out of the ground in Iceland. But being on the rift of two tectonic plates means that we have very, uh, a lot of, of, of movement in our geology. It gives us connection to the, uh, the geothermal resource not only. We also have lots of earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, we only, there was an vol active volcano that just uh, start, stopped erupting about a month ago. It erupted uh, continuously for about three, four months. But they usually erupt in the middle of the country, in the highlands, where we have no people. So we're lucky in that sense. So we are located exactly on the mid, or very close to the middle Atlantic Ridge, cut in half by the Eurasian Plate and the North American Plate. This is just an added uh, temperature gauge. We have much milder climate than, for example, Sapporo up in, in Hokkaido. Uh, but the Icelandic geothermal fleet, uh, fields are concentrated along the rift of those tectonic plates. All of our high temperature fields are exactly where the rift is located, and all of our all of the power plants that have been built over the last uh, 60 years have been built basically under that rift. And uh, actually uh, another interesting fact is that um, only a month ago, uh, the Icelandic power company and Fuji Electric signed an agreement about uh, a 45 megawatt turbine to be set up in the north of Iceland. So uh, our Cooperation with Japan has been ongoing now for 60 years and going very strong. So this is a typical sort of high temperature field, a very popular hiking route in the middle of Iceland. Of course, these are precarious places. We don't know what's happening there day to day. Uh, similarly to Japan, you've seen it in the news in the last couple of days where they've closed off Hakone. It's, not, it's a very similar area in, in uh, in its buildup. So although very popular tourist destinations, 
the Icelandic uh, rescue squads and the Icelandic uh, meteorologi meteorological agency is very much involved in educating people about being very careful in these areas. Now, how do you build a geothermal plant? Um, this is a long process. Building a geothermal plant, uh, it takes usually just the geo survey takes years. Uh, and these are very costly. But first, you would have to locate an area that has visible geothermal potential. Then you would go into the science of it, finding, uh, finding the right tools to find if there are actually, if, is there groundwater, because you usually need steam to run the turbines. Um, is the area wide enough? Are you tapping into the same resource? Are you tapping into multiple resources? So the geological survey of finding a suitable place for geothermal plants takes many years. And because it takes many years, and the geological surveys are so expensive, there's a lot of risk. And one of the things that has been difficult in developing the geothermal resource is who is going to take that risk? Who wants to pay for the money if it takes, for example, seven to 10 years just to get a plant operational. Uh, and in, in contrast, if you want to build a, a solar plant, a mega solar plant, or put solar panels on, on your roof, you can do that basically overnight. So there are many hurdles to actually setting up geothermal plants. This is just a schematic of normally the areas that are developed for geothermal uh, power plants. In Japan, these areas are usually located where you would traditionally have a Japanese onsen. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how do we uh, get the onsens to work with the local municipalities about building geothermal plants. Uh, it's a very sensitive issue in Japan. It's also a huge part of the Japanese tourism industry. So this is an ongoing process. In Iceland, we have been very lucky uh, we had geothermal power first, and then we had hot springs resorts. In Japan, you had hot springs resorts first, and then geothermal power plants. A typical geothermal plant would look something like this. This is a flash type uh, geothermal power plant. Uh, you drill test holes. You traditionally would have 15 to 30 uh, well heads or, or wells working at each time to get the steam out of the ground. They would go into separators and in the end turn turbines uh, that would create the uh, electricity. Uh, in addition to this, there's a lot of excess, excess water that falls away from the geothermal plant. And I will go into that a little bit later because that's a big part of the uh, distributed heating mechanism. Just a 3D picture of, of what a normal uh, well, geothermal well, would look like. And these normally go about one and a half to two kilometers down into the ground. This is a picture of uh, one of the first geothermal plants in, in Iceland, in Krafla, in, in the north of Iceland. Uh, it's uh, 60, uh, the capacity is 60 megawatts. It runs on two Mitsubishi heavy turbines. The first turbines that were uh, bought by Iceland were bought, by, uh, bought from a Japanese company. Uh, traditionally, as I said, uh, a borehole would be about two kilometers. But another very exciting uh, development that's happening in the geothermal uh, arena is deep drilling. Um, and again, this would be part of how we, would, we can grab some of that, those immense resources that are underground. Uh, Japan is involved in the deep drilling project, as are uh, most of the geothermal countries around the world, uh, America, Philippines, Indonesia, New Zealand, etc. So this is something to look out for in the next couple of years, how the research will evolve. Uh, do we have the capabilities to have boreholes going all the way down to basically molten lava to pick up s steam? Do we have to inject additional water? Uh, but a very exciting project. <coughs> now, in general, uh, electricity consumption in Iceland looks like this. With only 320,000 people, 
uh, and we create quite a lot of electricity. So the policy of the government for the last couple of years has been to sell that electricity to heavy industry. Traditionally, that's been aluminium. Uh, you need a lot of power to run aluminium smelts. Uh, Iceland has also used its strategic location to build up aluminium industry, shipping both to Europe, America, sometimes all the way to China. But we import the raw material normally from very far away. So not a very sustainable building, not a very sustainable model, although the electricity is very cheap. Ferrosilicon is also something that has been growing for the last couple of years. Uh, and what generally has been attracting the big aluminium and the silicon companies is the green image of Iceland, which is a little bit at odds with itself because uh, they are shipping raw material over half the world and bringing then the final sheets of aluminium or, or silicon back to market. But as you can see, residential consumption of electricity in Iceland is just 4.6%. Uh, uh, the prices that are given to the aluminium industry are not known, they are secret, um, which creates another conundrum for when we're talking about the green in image of Iceland. But in general, electricity in Iceland is very cheap. I'll go into that a little bit later. This is uh, just another picture of uh, the Reykjanes uh, geothermal power plant, which connects to a very exciting project that I will tell you about a little bit later. Now I'm just showing off about the Icelandic landscape, I'm sorry. Uh, but in general, uh, geothermal has lagged massively in growth on a global scale. Uh, we all know the, the, the pros and cons of, of solar and wind. They're, rather easily deployed. Uh, the price of wind turbines, the price of wind power is going down. Uh, the price of solar panels is rapidly decreasing. Uh, but nonetheless, as a base load and as a very good option for a renewable energy to power a 24-7 a load is geothermal, and we have not seen the rapid development that we were hoping for. This is just to give you a, a sense of the investment costs that uh, are involved in some of the most uh, developed renewable resources. Uh, biomass is, is, is relatively, relatively cheap, but geothermal much, much cheaper when it comes to actually the final turnkey investment costs uh, turning up into the energy costs into the into society, uh, and these are these statistics are a couple of years old, but uh, so the wind and the solar, the photovoltaics uh, costs per kilowatt hour have gone quite quite a bit. Now uh, the development of the power industry in Iceland is. Personally, I think it's quite phenomenal. We, uh, we had a few stumbling blocks, uh, but back in the 1940s when they decided to tap the Icelandic hot water that was already bubbling up to the surface, for example, in the capital, uh, the Icelandic government went full in to development of geothermal. Uh, in 1940s, uh, this was an, a critical game changer for us because importing oil and importing coal uh, was very expensive and for a developing country to, to rely on very expensive imports would be crippling. We could not bit, build up our communities, we could not heat our schools, heat our uh, government buildings, etc. Uh, not dissimilar for, from what Japan is going through now with a massive deficit just because of your importing na natural gas and coal and, uh, and oil, not coal, sorry. But since the 1940s, uh, geothermal development rose rapidly. Uh, and then during the, the oil crisis in the 70s, there was another sh push by the Jap Icelandic government to fully implement a policy to develop hydropower and geothermal power as there are main sources. And currently, uh, depending on how you calculate it, we, uh, our primary energy need comes nearly 100% from geothermal and hydro. Uh, not 
we're not up with, with Norway, where they have about, I think, 99% of, of hydroelectricity, but we are, we are getting there. But we are still dependent on oil for our fishing fleets, for our autom automobiles, our cars, and a few other uh, localities that have no access to hot water. For example, in, in the way west, and in the far east of the Icelandic coast. But the overall pie of geothermal usage in Iceland looks something like this. Uh, about, I think, uh, the electricity generation has gone a little bit uh, down since 2010, but about 35 to 40 percent is, is used for ele generating electricity that we pump into the grid. Uh, but I think the, the critical number here is 45% we use to heat spaces, to heat houses, to heat companies, uh, to heat greenhouses, various functions. And then uh, other businesses, for example, our local swimming pools use only 4% of our geothermal power, while almost every municipality in Iceland has a, a geothermal swimming pool. Um, again, since the 70s, and again, in a, a big jump was in the 1990s when we started uh, attracting the big aluminium businesses to Iceland, we have had to develop uh, geothermal power along with hydropower quite rapidly. Uh, and in 2007, uh, the biggest geothermal power plant, the third biggest in the world, Hetlisedi, uh, with about 303 megawatt installed capacity, uh, was opened in Iceland. Uh, and the, the geothermal power plant that I mentioned before, that was just uh, signed with Fuji Electric, will hopefully be opened in 2017, uh, the first generator. Now, how does Iceland compare to Japan? In Japan, you have, uh, I believe, the, the, the most current estimate that you have about the fifth or the sixth largest reserves of potential geothermal power in the world. Uh, countries like America, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, New Zealand are higher than Japan in potential, but Japan has an unbelievable potential to develop geothermal power. You use currently about 86% of the hot water or your geothermally heated water to for bathing and swimming. So think onsens, think centos. Uh, if you live in a big municipal, municipality like Tokyo, you're usually not using, using geothermal water. You're using water that has been heated with oil or electricity. Uh, so the, so the, the loss of economic benefits is, is massive for Japan in this sense. Uh, you are using about 0.4% for fish farming and only, and th I think this is uh, rather interesting because you have some of the, the snow heaviest areas in the world, Niigata, think Niigata or Hokkaido, and you could easily use some of this hot water to melt roads, to melt areas, to melt farming areas, for example. But again, we hope there's going to be a shift, hopefully this summer, by the Japanese government. You're only ut utilizing about 2,100 uh, megawatts thermal for 127 million people. Iceland has installed capacity uh, generating about 1,800 megawatts thermal for 300,000 people. And uh, three quarters are going for space heating. So again, what are, what are we using this hot water for? Space heating. Radiator is not dissimilar to this one. I'm not sure about where the, how, where the water comes from this, for this one, but placing a radiator under, under uh, uh, a window uh, and properly insulating your house, you save basically 80-90% uh, of your heating costs. Uh, again, greenhouses, fish farming, uh, heavy industry, uh, snow melting, pools and spas. And for an electricity, uh, as a producer of electricity, this is again a base load. This is something that you don't have to worry about if the sun is not shining, you don't have to worry about if the, the wind is not blowing. This is 24 seven. 
and available, uh, availability. Uh, there is no intermittent transmission problems usually with, with geothermal energy. Now, we started developing the resource back in the 40s, as I mentioned, but then it was just uh, for bathing, for cleaning, cleaning yourself and cleaning your clothes. Uh, there were a couple of areas within municipalities that normally people had to go to to clean their laundry and themselves. But in the 19, in, actually in 1930, the first building was connected uh, to district heating. And that was a primary school in the middle of Reykjavik city. And the Icelandic people were very quick to notice that uh, the benefits of having a heated building all year round, uh, there are not only economic costs, there are also societal costs. Uh, having kids in a warm building all day in school and back in the 1930s, uh, Reykjavik was a fairly, not fairly, we were very underdeveloped. So this, this was also, there were health costs uh, connected to this. Originally, uh, we were pumping the water more than a couple of kilometers. The technology now allows us to pump water a couple of kilometers with heat loss of less than two, centigrade, uh, two degrees centigrade, which is uh, rather impressive. So after we opened, after we connected the first building to district heating, other very important buildings in the, in the infrastructure of Reykjavik city started to uh, profess interest to connect as well. So hospitals, indoor swimming pools, uh, government buildings, etc. cetera. Um, this is just a, a, an example of what uh, a hot water pipe looks like. This is actually a pipe connecting uh, Nesjavetlir geothermal power plant about uh, 10 kilometers away, located right next to uh, UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site or National Park. But originally, we built these plants for the hot water. So we didn't build geothermal plants to get electricity. We got geothermal plants to get the hot water, to pump the hot water into the buildings. So in the beginning, electricity was just a byproduct. But over the years, by developing uh, binary systems, we've managed to get the best of both worlds. And a typical uh, geothermal, uh, a hot water well would look something like this. Storage tank, peaking stations, we pipe it out of the ground at over 100, I think it's a, actually a little bit hotter than this generally. Uh, but when it goes into the house and you turn on the tab, you are usually getting about uh, 35 to 50 uh, degree hot water. And when you take a bath in most houses in Iceland, you are actually bathing in geothermal water. So very healthy as well. This is a typical greenhouse uh, in Iceland. Uh, and this has been very beneficial for the greenhouse or for the agriculture industry because with very harsh weather conditions uh, and very expensive, uh, it's very expensive to import uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, Iceland has actually uh, been exporting tomatoes, which is unbelievable for a country that's in the middle of the Atl Atlantic. We, we're not exporting a lot, but we export a couple of tomatoes to Greenland, for example. But this has been a critical game changer for the agriculture industry in Iceland. Uh, and in these houses, we grow various crops. Uh, there's actually a, a rather lively crop of, uh, not a crop, but a uh, cultivation of Icelandic roses. Who would have thought that you would get roses in Iceland? And over the years, these greenhouses have gone very technical. They've gotten very, very high tech, so to speak. So now they are actually an important tool in our clean tech industry, in our health tech industry, where we can grow crops that are then uh, processed for their enzymes, for their uh, capabilities in various industries. Now, since I, we are in Japan and most of you are Japanese, uh, Icelandic people love to soak in hot water. Uh, and this originally was thought to, uh, the geothermal water was used for heating houses, but another byproduct are the geothermal pools. 
and these are scattered all over the country and are, how should I say, these are gathering places for Icelandic people to talk about what's happening in their world. So generally, not dissimilar from the Japanese sento, you would go there with your family, clean and go home. But now, as with Japan, almost everybody has a shower or a bath in their house, so this is, has turned more into a tourism attraction than something that people do on a daily basis. Now, this is not an uncommon sight uh, in building plots in Iceland. These are hot water pipes for snow melting. And on big parking lots, on the major traffic veins in Reykjavik, uh, when they were uh, redeveloped in the 80s and again in the 90s, and almost every current development of a building site in Iceland uh, uses uh, hot water for snow melting. And you can, you can imagine uh, the low cost for this versus how much we would have to pay to hire people to clean parking lots, to clean streets. You would have to have large trucks with plows clean, cleaning the Icelandic streets day in, day out. So this has been a great benefit to the Icelandic people. Um, this is again, has nothing to do with, with geothermal development, but uh, has a lot to do with the image of Iceland as a, geothermal, uh, a geothermally active place. This is Geysir, uh, which is located very close to our biggest geothermal resource. And a typical Icelandic uh, bathing pool. Now, uh, the total economic benefit of just developing geothermal in Iceland uh, in 2010 was calculated about uh, 500 to 80 million dollars. It's not a huge sum in, in the sense of, for example, the Japanese budget, but this is about, it was 4.6, I think it's closer to 7% now, of our GDP. And this is money that we can use for something else. This is something, uh, money that we can use for education, uh, for our welfare state. Uh, so 7% of our G annual GDP budget is a large sum. It's a great saving. And these savings come from not having to heat your house with oil or electricity, uh, related industry benefits, resource leasing, and societal impacts. Think about better insulated houses and people getting less cold. Think about better insulated houses and people buying less clothes. I mean, there are endless things that you could attribute to this. So back in the 1930s, Iceland, it's not a good picture, but it gives you a sense of, of the difference, what it looks like today. The black cloud that you see in the back is basically smog from coal. Uh, the societal impacts for Icelandic people living in Reykjavik, there was a massive migration from the, from the countryside uh, to Reykjavik, part because of industrialization. And the societal, sort of the health risks of living in Reykjavik were raised considerably just because we were firing up our houses and heating and getting electricity from coal. Uh, I, this is a little bit unfair. I know they don't, didn't have very good cameras in the 1930s, but this is what Reykjavik downtown looks like now. Uh, the amount of CO2 that we are releasing into the air annually, uh, we have already managed to fulfill our uh, Kyoto Protocol commitment. Uh, so I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm boasting about that a tiny bit. But how do we compare to, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a comparison to Japan because it's very difficult to compare a, a standard household in Japan because they heat, they can heat their houses with an, uh, with an aircon or they can heat it with a radiator. So uh, I'd rather uh, compare our Scandinavian um, uh, neighbors. Uh, but this is for a 100 square meter apartment in Scandinavia. Not many people in Japan have a 100 square meter apartment, but nonetheless. Um, so heating up 100 square meters in Reykjavik costs you about uh, 6,000 Japanese yen. And that's just for the space heating, just buying the hot water. Uh, another 6,000 yen would be for your electricity. But comparing that to, for example, the, uh, the capital of Denmark, Copenhagen, uh, the benefit is, is quite large. 
So this is an attraction for people living in Reykjavik and living in Iceland. Now here is a, a, a small diagram telling you about uh, our CO2 reduction for the last couple of, of years, last couple of decades. So in 1960s, we were emitting about uh, 250,000 tons of CO2 per year. We are down to nearly nothing. Uh, so in terms of our international commitment, in terms of our image as uh, a green country, uh, when we are trying to attract tourism, trying to attract uh, investment, uh, this is very important. Again, one of the things that have stood in the way of development in, in, in Japan, of geothermal development, is the conflict between your traditional industries, tourism, uh, onsen. There's actually an onsen kyokai lobby that is, is not in favor of, of developing geothermal. Uh, just to give you a sense of how we have dealt with this in Iceland. In Iceland, we don't see this as something that is contradictory. We see this as something that is supplementary to each other. And this is Nesjavetli power plant. And in the background, we have Thingvellir, which is our national park. We founded our parliament there. This is probably the most sacred place you could find in Iceland. Uh, and the Icelandic tourism authorities and the Icelandic energy authorities have made this work together perfectly. Uh, it fits well into our image of sustainability. It fits well in, into our uh, image of using our natural resources, not having to re rely on, on foreign resources, and is, is absolutely supplementary. This is an a, a aerial view of, of the Icelandic Blue Lagoon. We have been very lucky. This Blue Lagoon is another byproduct of digging for hot water. And now, this is our biggest tourism attraction. Uh, we have about, in Iceland actually, we, ju we just went over one million people visiting us in 2014. Uh, in Japan, I think you just went over nine million people last year. Uh, Iceland is looking to have about four to five million people in 2020. At the same time, Japan is thinking about uh, or trying to raise uh, the amount of people coming to 20 million. And right next to the Blue Lagoon, you have a geothermal power plant. Now, if you sit in the Blue Lagoon and you see smoke coming out, naturally you, you would think, okay, this doesn't necessarily fit. But what we have done is educate people who come and visit the Blue Lagoon, saying, okay, we are marrying here our geothermal resource with bathing in hot geothermal water. A marriage of the best of both worlds. Am I okay on time? Okay, but uh, since I, uh, I'm a little bit interested in, in how we got there, policy, the policy implement, uh, implementation, how did we get to uh, be where we are in terms of uh, renewable resources? Uh, in 1997, the Icelandic government started uh, a so-called master plan. And the only other country that has implemented uh, a renewable resource or energy master plan is Norway. There have been spots of, of, uh, of countries trying to shift energy policy, but nothing that takes, uh, as far as I know, that takes the overall potential of all uh, resources in Iceland. Uh, or all the resource, potential resources of a country and categorizes them into three categories. Uh, possible implementation of a, of a power plant or possible usage. Uh, uh, the second one is uh, uh, if it goes through a committee, it takes a long time to uh, assess the environmental impacts and the sustainability impacts of a program. And then we have national parts. So three categories that uh, have, um, that sort of give us the framework for how much we can de develop our sustainable resources. Uh, and of course, this is very political. The politicians make the policy. 
but they, re they rely on the expert opinion to decide, let's say, okay, this river we cannot build uh, a power plant, this geothermal area we cannot drill, let's build a national power park, uh, a national park. Uh, contentious, but the, f the fundamental pillar of the Icelandic uh, renewable energy scheme. And actually, uh, they have a homepage in, in English, so if you're interested in looking at how we actually built up the environmental master plan, you can take a look at this uh, ramma.is. Uh, and finally, what I want to show you, I want to show you a quick video, uh, which I believe shows the full potential of what we can do, not only with, with geothermal energy, but with innovation, with the right investment, and a little bit of forward thinking. Uh, there was a, a pilot scheme implemented by an Icelandic power, uh, power company uh, located by, uh, next to the uh, international airport. They thought, okay, uh, we have a power plant. There's water, hot water falling out of the power plant that's just seeping into the sediment. We're not using it. Let's offer that hot water to a company that's farming fish. Let's offer that hot water uh, to a greenhouse. Let's uh, offer the CO2 that's falling out from our, from our power plant to another company that can harness the CO2 and bind it into methanol. And the, the, the goal is to create a fully sustainable ecosystem surrounded around that geothermal power plant. And this is called the Reykjanes Resource Park. Uh, and here we have, again, we have molecular farming, uh, growing uh, plants in greenhouses uh, to pick up proteins. Uh, there are fish farming uh, companies. There are, there's a very exciting company called Carbon Recyc Recycling, who's actually making uh, the methanol out of CO2. Uh, we have green data centers. Uh, the Japanese company Hitachi actually is investing in green data centers in Iceland inside this resource park. So if you think about the, a holistic view of what comes out of a geothermal power plant, uh, this is a fun thing to look at. And this is something that other countries can e easily mirror and implement, uh, for example, here in Japan. But I'm going to show you a short video and then we'll have a, a, a Q&A. try to get some uh, sound for you guys. Right? Okay. Today, everything revolves around renewable energy. Swansea Resource Park is the world's premier showcase for geothermal energy and the various uses of its production. The park is built on a simple idea where geothermal elements lay the foundation and power a sustainable industrial park. The concept revolves around that the spill water waste from one company in the park can be used as inputs for another. The future outcome is aimed at one ideal, a totally green industrial park built on geothermal resources. The first major consequence of the sourcing geothermal resource park is the Blue Lagoon. 
It is scientifically recognized for its skin and power. The company is a market leader in the development of health-related tourism, both in the area of spa and wellness and in developing medical treatments for psoriasis. It also develops and markets a skincare product based on the lagoon's active ingredients. Seawater mixed with minerals, silica, and algae. According to National Geographic, it is one of the wonders of the world. In its description of the Blue Lagoon, National Geographic says, the steaming turquoise pools of Iceland's Blue Lagoon, trapped in volcanic rock, represent an otherworldly vision. It is a geothermal gift of nature. Geothermal planets use less than 20% of the land Coal facilities and wind farms respectively cover. They need less than 2% of the required fresh water for a nuclear, coal, or oil power plant. Geothermal plants are also considered to be more reliable than coal or nuclear plants because they can run consistently 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Geothermal plants emit only a tiny fraction of what conventional fossil fuel plants do. But it is still carbon dioxide. And there we come to our next stop in the Geo Park. Carbon Recycling International. The industrial unit captures CO2 from the output steam at Swansea Power Plant and converts it into renewable methanol. It is a clean fuel and can be blended at different levels with gasoline to meet renewable energy directives for existing automobiles and hybrid flexible vehicles. One of the most rapidly growing projects in the Geo Park is Orph Genetics, a pioneer in the manufacturing of growth factors and other recombinant proteins in plants. One of those spin-off products, or BioFact, marketed by the daughter company Seath Cosmetics has been proven to stimulate skin rejuvenation. Perhaps we can add to the list of all these natural wonders in the Geo Park a new modest item, the Fountain of Youth. There are two data centers in the Geo Park, strategically chosen to revolutionize data by directly addressing the main problem for the business today, namely the power source. Here they can grow in a 100% green, zero carbon footprint environment where energy is more reliable and costs less. The future vision for the Geo Park ranges from extensive algae-based productions to the first aluminum smelter in the world only powered by geothermal energy. In the park we have numerous natural wonders, geysers, hot springs, rows of craters, beautiful lava fields, and the meeting of two tectonic plates, the Eurasian and the American, where you can literally walk between two continents. You can even experience the inside of a volcano. Geothermal energy calls for a broad view of opportunities and can create multiple different streams of revenue. Even though the use of geothermal energy in Iceland has focused on house heating and electricity generation for the power grid and industry, the spin-off benefits are even greater. Greenhouses, warm water for aquaculture, and warm spoon pools are widespread, as are spas, skincare and beauty producers, and various other job-creating processes and spin-offs in industry and tourism. There are, in addition, a wide variety of applications for geothermal energy use, including fish farming, drying methods for food production, soil warming, snow melting, industrial heating and industrial processing. On top of everything else, these diverse outputs of a single geothermal resource make its development economically feasible distinguishing geothermal from all other energy resources.
Now, sin since, since they made this movie, actually, Carbon Recycling has scaled up its plant. Uh, they've, I think, uh, quadrupled in size. And there's another fish farming company that's actually, uh, hopefully next year or next next year, going to be exporting Awabi uh, to uh, Japan. So uh, it, it just gives you, hopefully, it gives you an idea of sort of the possibilities that we have with geothermal. Thank you. Absolutely. アイソランドですか。Can I? Is it okay if I respond in English?、Um, as I said, we we started developing the geothermal power sort of for heating. So it was not originally for electricity. So they were in the beginning they were much smaller scale. So in that sense, Iceland has been very lucky. We've had a gradual sort of implementation of geothermal.、Uh, for example, small localities, small cities could build just a heating pump. They maybe one two wells.、Uh, there have been, of course, economic,、uh, environmental arguments, because we are. We normally have to build the geothermal plants on very pristine land,、uh, but in general, there has been a consensus of this is the way we should go: building hydro dams or building geothermal plants.、Uh, in terms of, I, I'd rather want to see it in sort of what 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 is happening. What, what why is Japan finding it so difficult to implement, and then I think we can look at the Icelandic example.、Uh, I think it's just about education.、Uh, it's just about telling people, for example, like you, that this is this is possible. This is it's economically feasible.、Uh, it's of course subject to very strict environmental regulation, but it's just about education and ed educating the population that this is a better alternative. In my view, than most other renewable sources, or at least a combination of of them. Just no, sorry. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah.、Uh, my name is Mark Lawrence, and、um, I'm doing education and stuff. And、uh, it seems to me that the、uh, other countries could be using this more,、um, as you mentioned, because of、uh, you know, all the places. That's a good question.、Uh, uh, Norway and geothermal—they are not looking to develop geothermal.、Uh, they are al almost purely hydro.、Uh, I think the resources in, in Norway are not there. That would be too costly.、Uh, they would have to drill too deep, and I just think they—they、uh, are not located strategically for geothermal.、Uh, but other countries, for example, Japan,、uh, and underdeveloped countries like the Philippines, Indonesia.
uh, even Papua New Guinea, uh, they have massive resources. But the problem usually is financing. It's usually, uh, in the case of Iceland, this was a government-sponsored program almost from the beginning. Uh, it was only later, and much later in the sort of uh, the production uh, chain, that private companies came in. Uh, we had funds and grants for the building of these for municipalities in the beginning. Uh, so if the lead is not taken by the actual government, uh, private companies and private contractors are not going to take the risk of building a very sort of uh, a power plant that has such a long lead time. Uh, the, the risk financing is, is too difficult. Uh, what countries, Japan is, has already started to get government more into funding. Uh, only in 2013, they changed the financing options for municipalities to get uh, loans, which are also underwritten by the Japanese government, to get development online. And then you invite the private contractors, because they will not take the, origin, uh, the, the most of the risk. Because in the end, uh, it's the municipalities that will see the biggest economic benefit. Uh, in terms of solar in, in, the, in the Arab states, um, well, they have, they have the money to build pie-in-the-sky mega solar projects. But uh, I think in terms of, of, of solar, it should be more distributed. It should be devolved. It should be local transmission for local production, local local supply. Yeah. Also, in the Icelandic case, um, their uh, heat benefit was immediate, wasn't it? And yes. The very beginning. And so, um, of course, investment in a heat-producing geothermal plant is much lighter, much less of a risk than a full-blown electricity generation. So it seems like because of the way that your history went, um, it, it was probably always easier to develop your thermal than it would be maybe in some of the other countries who could nonetheless benefit from, from more investment. Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, what municipalities and cities and, and prefectures are doing, for example, here in Japan, is realizing that with access to funding, with access to loans and grants to actually do the, the, the geo-surveys. Uh, they, they don't have to ma build massive scale projects. Uh, think about uh, Fukushima. Let's say, uh, I mean, it's very cold. It's very cold in Fukushima and you're spending an enormous amount on uh, gas and oil just to heat communities in an environment where you have access to abundant hot water. So there is a, there's an emotional uh, issue here as well uh, because it's connected to the onsen and, and all of this. Um, but primarily the, the driver in Iceland was access to funding and access to risk funding for the test drilling because you have to do numerous test drilling and actually uh, just good I take it, there are not enough drills in the world to do all the test drilling. So we are exporting Icelandic drills to the Philippines to do test drilling. That's the other way, it doesn't seem, it doesn't compute to me. We're not a heavy manufacturing country. So uh, I mean there are barriers, but there are usually sort of no-brainer ways to deal with them. because of the erosion. Right. Uh, yeah, parts of, of the wells and the wellheads, there's a lot of erosion, but this is one of the things that Icelandic engineers have been focusing on for the last couple of years, how to deal with the erosion. Uh, it's, uh, the United Nations has a geothermal training program in Iceland, and I think uh, some of our best specialists are teaching young specialists from Philippines, usually underdeveloped uh, ADB countries, for example, Asian development uh, partners to come to Iceland to learn about how to deal with these erosion uh, factors. Yeah. But one thing that I haven't really talked about in my presentation today is that, okay, we have 
lots of hot water. Uh, we could heat, heat our houses, but 40% of all uh, electricity is used to heat houses in Japan, or globally, I think it's generally 40%. You could cut that 40%, probably by half, even by three-fourths, by just insulating. So there has been strong building regulation in Iceland to also um, complement that we are sending distributed hot water to the housing uh, areas, but also have very strict building regulation that you have to keep the heat in your house. Because if you have hot water and just evaporates, that would mean double or triple the amount of hot water we would need to pump into the house. So there is... There are very few countries that are doing a holistic view on how to save and make their electricity. Mm -hmm. Finally, could I just ask, do you, do you know um, if, if we really understand, if scientists really understand how much greenhouse gases, including CO2 and methane, are released in the process of geothermal? If we do know how much uh, CO2 and... Yeah. The monitoring is, is very good, as far as I know, um, because the environmental assessments that they go through, they have to give a concrete plan and then a follow-up very, very often to see if they're actually uh, releasing the amount that they said they were going to release. But in terms of what exactly they do to, to, uh, to assess the CO2, I'm, 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 I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I kind of wonder about that. Yeah. You know, it would be very easy to fudge the numbers if you didn't know where the CO2 might be released uh, in a collateral way. I don't know how controlled. I don't know how controlled the situation is on the, on the ground. The the integrated system is very controlled, of course, but we. Uh, we there could be sprouts of of sulfur or 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 yeah, CO2 maybe. But uh, I think the, the environment is just as controlled as it is with most other electricity generation plants. Yeah. yeah. Any first questions? No, but just to give you a, a sort of a sense of what's happening in Japan, so in 2013, there are now 20 projects at least under assessment here and there in Japan. Uh, and this was basically all due to municipalities and, and, and cities and wards being able to have access to capital. So there was a fundamental shift in the way Japan uh, is helping the geothermal industry. And I think, uh, but the, the assessment time is very long, so you will not see a jump in, in, in Japanese geothermal power, but in the next 10, 15 years, hopefully. And hopefully a, a better sort of holistic approach to heating your environment. So does um, Iceland also have an idea or a project, for example, to export this heat heating know-how and technology to Japan? Uh, it's very difficult. Um, we have very few specialists. Well, we, we think we have a lot of specialists, but when we're dealing with countries like America, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, the challenge is enormous. And just the first contact to see, okay, can we work with this municipality or this company because we have maybe 10 experts. It's just a, it's just a, a question of numbers for us where can we put our specialist to the best use? And I think the return on investment is, is it's not best in Japan. I think companies and specialists are going to countries that have uh, faster move, moving bureaucracies, faster moving companies, uh, and zanen nagara, Japan has not the fastest moving mindset when it comes to implementing big projects. So, yeah. Is there anything going in that direction? 
Not that I've seen, no. These are purely uh, electric power plants. Um, because one of the problems with Japan is access to groundwater. Uh, and be, because Iceland, the sediments in Iceland are also very young. They're very, uh, I don't know the English word, there's a lot of seepage of groundwater in the Icelandic sediments. Mean, meaning that superheated water with steam is very commonplace. Uh, in Japan, you have less seepage of groundwater into, your, into the sediments. Meaning that you are getting steam, but you are not always necessarily getting hot water. Which means that you would maybe either have to pump hot water, seawater, but then you would need all kinds of filters and, and mechanism to, to not ruin your uh, power plant. Um, so the actual environmental assessment, the, 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 the mapping out of the sediments uh, is much more precarious in Japan than Iceland. 